What is grace? Grace is community. Grace is passion. Grace is for everyone. Today we wrap up our series on Moses. We've spent the summer exploring the book of Exodus and the unfolding story of God choosing Moses to lead the chosen people of God from slavery in Egypt to freedom in Israel. Uh, Exodus doesn't quite get to the end of the story, though. We'll have to explore another time when Israel enters this promised land. Instead, Exodus ends with the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle. We're going to hear about the tabernacle from Sal. A little bit of the story shows up earlier in Exodus 33, where Moses sees God's glory, and every time he enters the tent of meeting, God is present. Uh, now the tent gets an upgrade. It becomes the tabernacle where God will reside. Let's hear about it in Exodus 41 through 15. Hear now God's word. The Lord spoke to Moses on the first day of the first month. You shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the Ark of the Covenant, and you shall screen the Ark with the curtain. You shall bring in the tab table and arrange its setting, and you shall bring in the lampstand and set up its lamp. You shall put the golden altar for incense before the Ark of the Covenant, and set up the screen for the entrance of the tabernacle. You shall set the altar of burnt offering before the entrance of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting, and place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. You shall set up the gold all around and hang up the screen for the gate of the court. Then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all its furniture so that it shall become holy. You shall also anoint the altar of burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar shall be most holy. You shall also anoint the basin with its stand and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and shall wash them with water, and put on Aaron sacred vestments, and you shall anoint him and consecrate him, so that he may serve me as priest. You shall bring his sons also, and put tunics on them, and anoint them as you anoint their father that they may serve me as priests. And the anointing shall admit them to perpetual priesthood throughout all generations to come. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks to be God. Thanks be God. Amen. And from Hebrews 8:10, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Let's pray. God, may we be an inclusive community, passionately following Jesus Christ. Open us to your divine presence today. Speak to us here in this place. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A memory I hold dear is from my childhood. When I was 12, I went to my first sleepaway camp. 
Uh, my older brothers had done the same at my age, and I had looked forward to it. I even had some friends from school that were going to the same place as me. Uh, this was when I lived in Buffalo, and this camp wasn't in the woods or in the mountains. It was on the shores of Lake Erie. Now, I know when you think about the beach around here, it's always by the ocean, and you should. Uh, it's beautiful, and there's lots of entertainment built up on the boardwalks. Uh, the sands of Lake Erie have nothing on the Jersey Shore, uh, but Lake Erie is one of the biggest lakes in the world. It's so big you can't see across to the other side, and the waves can be as big and as dangerous as any ocean. The sunrises and sunsets can be just as breathtaking, and for me, it is on the sands of that beach, staring out across the water, that I spoke to God for the first time. Of course, I had grown up praying to God. Uh, when I lost something or it was dinner time, my parents taught me to talk to God then, but I did it because they told me to. I didn't necessarily choose it for myself. I hadn't opened myself to God and whatever it was that he had for me in this great big world. So there I was at sleepaway camp, bunked with a bunch of other rowdy, ridiculous seventh graders, and I found myself asking God for more than just helping me to find something or for my food to be blessed. I was asking God to be at the center of my life, for God to be with me and to guide me, and most of all, for wisdom. I didn't want to lead a meaningless life. I wanted the choices I made to mean something, so I prayed for wisdom. In many ways, in often small, imperceptible ways, my prayers were being answered. The biggest was that in talking with God, I felt like God was there, like there was someone or something beyond myself, yet present with me. I bet if we took a moment, many of you could share similar stories of when you felt the presence of God, of when God suddenly became more than just an idea, a concept that didn't have much to do with your day-to-day -day life. I know, I know the room would be full of stories of these moments. One such story is of a woman who went to church twice a week with her little dog. Every time she would sit in the back of the church, and at the end of the service, there was an invitation to come forward and pray. She would always go to the front of the church to pray to God, and her dog would follow her right up to that spot. Sadly, she was a married woman with an incredibly abusive husband. He was so abusive, at one point, she was beaten to the point of death. There was no law enforcement in this place, though, so the man was never put on trial for what he did. He continued his life, just him, and that little dog. The husband noticed one day, though, that the dog had disappeared for a few hours and then later had come back. The same thing happened several days later. The dog would disappear and then come back. It kept happening over and over. So finally, one of those days, the man decided to follow the little dog. And what do you know? The dog led the man straight to the back seat of the church. The man sat next to the dog, which happened to be right where his wife used to sit. Then at the end of the service, the dog went to the front of the church at the time for prayer. The man was so moved by this that he followed the dog and that day gave his life over to Jesus Christ. Despite what I'm sure were years of his wife telling him about the Lord, it wasn't until he himself was in that building, in the presence of God, led by a little dog, that God became real to him. For you, it probably wasn't a little dog that helped you sense God's presence for the first time, but many of us have equally amazing stories. Perhaps it was here in this sanctuary or at home in your living room. Maybe a parent, a spouse, or a friend, or even a child helped you know God. I know someone who uh, once was driving through town and a child pointed up to a church and said, that's our church. That's where we're going to go from now on. And that's exactly what they did. It's been their church now for over 50 years. Sometimes an encounter with God is completely surprising, showing up when you least expect it to. Now, some might be skeptical. You might be saying, come on, can we really meet God? Even if God were real, would God really take the time to show up in one specific place? How is here any better than over there? How can a God who has no body, who can't be seen, be present? 
Aren't we just kidding ourselves with this stuff? I guess that's possible. I've heard plenty of people, though, who say they have had personal encounters with God. They have spoken to God, or God spoke to them. Uh, People have had such dramatic encounters that after being present with God, their entire existence here on earth seems meaningless in comparison. One of my favorite authors is Dostoevsky. He was known to have epilepsy, which caused him to have these incredible religious experiences. He described it once as complete harmony in the world. He said it was so strong and the bliss so sweet that he would perhaps give his entire life for just a few moments of that feeling. One thing is for sure, we as humans are capable of incredible, earth-moving, world-shaking experiences with something beyond ourselves that can change our lives forever. Moses had an experience like this. Exodus 34 describes how Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments in his hand. Unlike the first time when the people were worshiping a golden calf and he broke the tablets with the commandments, this time he, his face is shining from speaking with God. It's so unusual and so intense, the people can't even look at Moses. Moses has to put on a veil to hide his face But every time Moses would go to speak with the Lord, he would uncover it. It was as though he was speaking face-to-face with God. But something is missing in all of this. Moses is with the Israelites in the desert, but they don't have a home. They simply pick up their tents and move wherever God leads them. We've glossed over this in our journey through Exodus, but over and over the people see God at work in a cloud guiding them during the day and a pillar of fire at night. When they were at Mount Sinai, the cloud was over the mountain, and I shared previously that it was very much like an active volcano, thunder, lightning, and the earth rumbles. Uh, The people see from a distance the presence of God, and they are scared. They don't want to encounter God too closely. They want Moses to do it for them so they don't die. So Moses sets up the tent outside of the camp. It's far away from where the people are. But here in the story at the end of Exodus, a new thing is happening. The tent is getting an upgrade. The people bring their gold and silver, fancy silks and acacia wood. The best artisans do the work to make vestments for the priests. They build a courtyard and a table for the bread offered to God. There was a lamp and incense and oil. They made an altar for the burnt offerings. And finally, the Ark of the Covenant, where the Ten Commandments would be placed. The Ark was meant to mark the very presence of God. It was called God's footstool, as though he were standing on the ark or hovering above it. All these things come together to transform the tent of meeting into a tabernacle. Later in the book of Numbers, they would say things are different. With these changes, the, the tabernacle is no longer on the edge of camp. It's moved to the very center. God is, at least symbolically, in the midst of the people. God is right there with them. Later, when Israel got to the promised land, they built a temple to replace the tabernacle tent. Uh, King Solomon completes it and dedicates everything to God, and as the Ark of the Covenant is put in place, the glory of God descends. It's a cloud just like it was for Moses, and 1 Kings 8 says, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So the picture we get from this passage is that God's presence is palpable. People can literally see and feel it. All these tools from incense and oil and bread to the ark were all ways that God became real to the people. Now that is a a beautiful thing. But more than one person is going to notice there's something wrong here. God's presence at the temple is great, but there was only one temple. Was God really stuck in that one place? Eventually, that temple was desecrated and completely destroyed. So Israel rebuilt it, which you can read about in the book of Ezra. Uh, That's the temple Jesus is at in in the Gospels. But again, that temple is also desecrated and destroyed. 
Did God really intend to have just one place to experience the Lord's presence? In many traditions, pilgrimage is an important part of religious life. If you've never had a chance to visit a holy site, I want to encourage you to do so. Something powerful happens when we dedicate our time and energy to seeing these places. I've heard it a dozen times how life-changing it is, especially when you have a, a chance to visit a place like Israel, where Jesus himself walked. If you haven't gone, do it. Let the pilgrimage enhance your spiritual life. And perhaps the Jewish temple is meant to do something similar. Even Jesus visited the temple in Jerusalem during the Passover feast. Uh, but there is something else happening throughout the Bible, too. The story of Moses is the beginning of the people's discovery of God's presence. And later, after pe the people turn away from God, the prophet Jeremiah declares that God will abandon Israel. They are faithless, so the temple will be destroyed. The same is true of any holy site. Even this beautiful church, as important as it is to so many people, isn't the only place to meet God. This church can neither hold God nor contain the Lord's glory. God is too big. Even those other holy sites, like the temple in Jerusalem or the Vatican where Peter and Paul are buried, that's still not enough. I think of the people who say, I don't really need church. God is out in nature, so I go there to meet with God. Well, at least that acknowledges the grandness of God. But still, we fall short when we are trying to meet God to go somewhere to experience the Lord. The sweep of the scriptures is about moving from experiencing God in these singular places, from the mountain, the temple, the church, somewhere out in nature, to this grand encounter with God literally everywhere we go. The book of Hebrews 11 describes how all these people of faith had lived and died. They were called from a safe place to a dangerous one, from the familiar to the brand new. They longed for this new place described as a better country. They longed to be with God in a permanent way. Jeremiah 31 says God is writing his law on our hearts. We won't need a temple, a church, a book, or any tools to know God. In any circumstance, even the worst ones imaginable, God will be right there with us. We will know God everywhere we go. How would your life change knowing this to be true? How might you respond to others or respond in life's toughest situations knowing that God is right there with you, not hold up waiting for you to show up in church, would that make a difference for you? There was a man who took an extended break from his job to take care of his father who was dying of cancer. The father was frail and dependent on his son, Bill, to do just about everything for him. Bill's father was physically failing, but his mind was alert throughout all of this. In those final days, Bill took on the role of parent to his dad. He would put him to bed every night and read to him before he fell asleep, just as his father had done for him when he was a child. As Bill read, his dad would stare at him, eyes wide open, with a beaming smile uh, as he looked at his son. It was somewhat frustrating for Bill, and he would scold his father, telling him he had to close his eyes and go to sleep as he read. But every night, as Bill read, one eye would pop open, and then soon a second, and his father would be staring, smiling at him again. Over and over this happened. After his father died, Bill said, his was a story of a father who couldn't take his eyes off his son. And how much more for each of us with God? God won't close his eyes to us. We are his beloved. No matter where we go, 
or what happens in our lives. You may have a special place where you meet with God, but know that God is always with you. Be blessed when you visit holy places or when you make sacred pilgrimages, but know that God wants to meet you right here, right now, and tomorrow, and the next day, and the next, no matter where you go. No matter what trouble you might find yourself in, God is there. When we do that, when we see that God is with us everywhere and God is in the center of our lives, we see the holy things around us are simply a shadow of the heavenly. God's divine presence surrounds us and flows through us so that in every situation we can meet it with the same love that God has for us. Amen? Amen. Let's continue in worship uh, by sharing together in a confession of faith. It's in your hymnal number 890. I believe the words will also be up on the screen. Let's join together. For everything happening at Grace, check out our website at gumc.org.